my, my mean mama did. She took every cotton picking dish that we owned out of the cabinet. Out of the high ones, low ones, underneath ones, fruit jars, because we drank out of them. That's one of some of the best china you can get, pickle jars and stuff. And she made me wash every dish that was ever made since the 1900s till now. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I really wasn't, but she was going to make one out of me. And I found out it's better to do it uh, the right way, which I never did get all that good at it. Uh, but uh, I, I'm kind of proud to say I never did get all that good at it because uh, I wasn't getting fired. It was impossible to get yourself fired from doing chores around our place. It just got worse. Are there any more folks that need a, need a handout that didn't get one? All right, Brother John. You know what it means to lick your calf over? Huh? That's what you just had to do. Amen. Just let him know on that. He'll figure it out someday. Uh, holiness. Everybody say holiness. The Bible says very plainly, without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, I... Uh, Last night I couldn't sleep. A lot of things on my mind. And I was really sleepy. Anybody ever had that happen? You really, really sleepy and then you go to bed and you forgot you were sleepy? Well, my mind forgot I was sleepy last night and I began to think. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't know that this is fair. I really don't know that it's fair. And I don't know that I want it quoted across the board. But uh, I, I really feel like uh, if you if you got to miss church, Wednesday night might be the worst service to miss. Uh, because uh, we're going to, by the help of the Lord, we're going to reach for people that need the Holy Ghost on the weekend. But Wednesday nights, we're going to try to make Christians out of us. Notice I said us. I am learning. And I found out some things in preparing for this lesson. I'm never, I'm never going to make it to where Jesus was. But brother David, with the help of the Holy Ghost, I don't ever have to stop trying. Holiness. Absolute conformity. You notice I did your papers a little bit different tonight. Y'all notice that? It's just an experiment. Uh, uh, I may do them different with every lesson, every section of this. Uh, Brother David's been so kind that he's going to at least begin the next session for us. May just let him do the whole thing. Uh, he may, uh, he may uh, do better than me about moving through it. Uh, but uh, holiness means absolute conformity to the character and the will of God. There are two components of holiness. If you remember, I told you in the very first lesson, being separate and being holy are not the same thing. Okay, they are not the same thing. Uh, you go out tonight to Taster's and there's somebody that's out there that's got uh, a rainbow colored hair and it's spiked up about this high and they've got the sides shaved up above their ears. They're separate from everybody in there. Right? You probably ain't going to find two folks look like that at the same time on the same night in New Matter, Missouri. Okay? Now I told you, I spent a little time in New York here a while back and you probably ain't going to find two folks look like me in New York City. <laughs> but that's just separate. Okay? Uh, but we're required to be separate. That word peculiar people in a passage we're going to reference later. It, we're required to be separate. 
But our separation is not just relative to the world. We don't just maintain a little bit of separation. So we're to be separate from sin and the world's values, the world's value system. It's not the same as ours. How many saw the news today? Anybody, anybody read the news today? I saw it on the, my news feed over in my office, uh, what the governor of Louisiana did today. Anybody see that? Look at it. Google it. Look at it when you get home. The values of the world and the values of the church are not the same and probably from here on out are not going to be the same. As a matter of fact, as closer we get to the coming of the Lord, we're liable to have a revival of how we used to be back in the 70s and the 60s when we was made fun of. Because we're going to have to, with the help of the Holy Ghost, get further and further away from the world, but not because we're drawing away from them. But the world's drawing away from us. This is the way everybody used to live. Can I get an amen up in here? Read your history books, look at it. This is the way everybody used to live. Moral, holy, separate. I, I'm not, you, you understand, we ain't got on how we dress clothing wise yet. We're talking about when, when somebody's word was true. Okay? We're talking about a, 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 what God thinks matters to me. Instead of, as came out in the news in the last year or so, that if you was born a man and you want to be a woman, that means God made a mistake. Nobody saw that? Nobody read that? Where God made a mistake? God don't make no mistakes. And the world doesn't have the, the, uh, the privilege of telling him they made a mistake. And in fact, Sister Leanne, that is the, the ultimate thumbing of your nose to God. And when he gets enough... When he gets enough, he gets rid of everybody that didn't line up with what he wanted. <laughs> Boy, it's a little tight in here tonight. Y'all feeling bad because some folks is missing or something? The second thing is separation from sin and the world's values. The second thing is dedication to God. And his will. So we are separated from the world, but we're separated unto God. And and where we're trying to get, where boy, I feel something right now. I'm gonna make every cotton picking one of you shake my hand before we leave tonight. I'm gonna go to the back and beat you all to the back door. I know you will. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. Our Wednesday nights, boy, they've been good. They've been good. And, and, and don't let nothing rise up in you. Don't let nothing rise up in you that I got to talk about. Okay? Well, I can't let something rise up in the spirit. And, and God have mercy on you. Don't let me hear you say, I'm about tired of hearing that. Well, it's going to be on like a pot of neck bones. Okay? Smile at me, everybody. Separation from sin and the world's values. It feels awkward for some reason in here. Um, Jonathan asked me before church if I, if I get nervous before I preach. And I told him, no, not really, just sometimes. But I forgot to tell him I get nervous in the middle of preaching sometimes. The starting point of holiness, if you are going to be holy, and if you desire any relationship with God at all, you desire to be holy. If you desire any relationship, and the starting point of holiness, holiness does not work from the outside in. Holiness works from the inside out, and as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The starting point of holiness is to have a transformation in thinking. Now I want to review just a little bit from last week, like the last four weeks' lessons. 
Notice the cognitive, the thinking words, the mind words, words that deal with thinking and the mind. Ephesians 4 and 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth from now on. We talked about that a while. Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Verse 18. Having the understanding, the cognitive word, dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, a cognitive word, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, that's your moral compass that's set in you, have given themselves over into lascivious to work all uncleanness with greediness. Verse 20. But ye have not so learned Christ. That's a cognitive word. It's, it's education. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 23. And then verse number 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace unto the hearers. We know what is not what is not supposed to be in our minds. Ephesians chapter number 4. And we went over it for, for at least two weeks and maybe three. We know what's not supposed to be in our minds. We know that we're not supposed to be vain in our thinking. We know we're not supposed to be consumed with things that offer absolutely no edifying benefit to our lives. And we know that we've got to make sure in order to be holy, in order to become holy. Now... How many of you picked up on what I taught last week about Peter? Raise your hand if you picked up on it. Now, do y'all say I'm a good preacher because I holler a lot? Or something? Did anybody take notes from last week? Then, then you should be, what did I talk about Peter last? That's only like, this is the eighth day since I talked about it. And I'm not being ugly, but we, we got to get that. I taught us that he got the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter number 2. But the Holy Ghost changed him on top of Cornelius' house in Acts chapter number 10. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, you don't get everything right that minute that you need and you've not arrived from that moment. But when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, it is a process. The Lord begins to work on you. And we talked about Brother David and I, I talked to somebody else about that this week. Peter wrestled with that. I think Peter wrestled with that until they crucified him. Okay, but we've got to learn that the Holy Ghost, the plan of the Holy Ghost is not for you to fail. The plan for the Holy Ghost is for you to succeed. And the way that we do that is we ensure that our minds are holy. I've got to get my mind right. I've got to get my heart right. I've got to get the inner me right so the Holy Ghost can fix the outer me. Because if you just, I, I heard somebody one time talking about a politician said, change, change, change. And somebody said, you can go up there and paint the White House yellow and guess what you got? A yellow White House, ain't nothing changed. So, we're going to get into the outward things. We're going to, when Brother David starts, uh, I'm going to be amen in him like, like nobody's business when we start talking about, because the first thing we got to worry about getting holy after our mind is our mouth. We're going to work our way out. But I come tonight to help us. To have practical things. I've got to have a holy mind. If I don't have a holy mind, I can have it all together on the outside and be lost as a goose in a hailstorm. So we know what's not supposed to be in our minds. Are y'all ready to work with me a little bit? I feel like, I'm, I, feel like I need to go put on an army helmet and a shield and stuff. We know what's not supposed to be in our minds. Unholy things. But what are some practical ways we can ensure that our minds become and stay holy? 1 Peter chapter 1 verse number 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Let's just start right at the beginning. Gird up the loins of your mind. Now that word gird up has a very clear definition. Can, Violet, can I borrow your blanket, baby? Yeah, thank you, even though you don't want to. Okay. They wore robes back in them days. But they wore robes back in those days. And when they would gird them up, they, I, I can't really do it, but I'm just kind of trying to give you a show. They would grab a hold, it ain't really here. They would grab a hold of the back, and they would pull it up to the front and stick it down in their belt or girdle. And it was to remove, I know they can't hear me. I better get back. People been watching it and complaining because they can't hear me. All right, you can have it back. There you go. <laughs> so, but what it was, and I want you to follow me now. What it was, what it was, was removing obstructions around your legs. That hinder you from going somewhere. So to gird up means to remove hindrances. Let me just warn you. If y'all think it's been tied in here up till now, you ain't seen nothing over the next few minutes. Because I'm really going to get real, okay? I'm going to get real. I need to get real. We don't have enough time to play tiddlywinks no more. We ain't got time to play footsies. I got to get real. Gird up. Remove the hindrances and obstructions. And it always precipitated movement, Sister Maria. It always, there was, a, you didn't just gird up your loins and then go kick back in the recliner. But you gird, and Brother Pete, they would even told them to gird up their loins and eat. With their loins gird about. Why? Be ready to move at a moment's notice. What's going on in your life that God's trying to do in your life? And God's trying to do a work. God's trying to do a calling. God's trying to do something and bless you. But he can't because of where your mind is. And all of these, boy, I tell you what. All of these things that's going on in our mind constantly till sometimes the first time we think about the Lord is when we lay our head down at night. We got so much going on in our lives and we're so busy. The Bible says, gird up the loins of your mind. Gird up, remove the hindrances and obstructions. So what do I have to do? What is the very first thing? You got it on your paper. What is the very first thing that I have to do to gird up the loins of my mind? I got to find out what's causing my mind to be jacked up. What keeps me anxious? What keeps me worrying? What keeps me depressed? What keeps me discouraged? What is it in my life uh, that every time I see it coming, I cover up, cower down, and hide because I know all hell's fixing to break loose in my mind? Uh, I got to learn to identify that. What keeps me messed up? What keeps my mind in the wrong place? Identify them. you got to find out what it is. Now there are two main practical areas. I don't know everything about everybody's life. Unfortunately, I know too much about some of us' life. Not because you tell it, but because your face is a book. And I've got to let you know something. And I'll shut my eyeballs so I won't look at you. But there's about four or five of you that every time I kneel down to pray, your face starts pray, your faces start parading around in my mind and I have to pray for you. Because every day of your life, it's like balancing on a cliff. Uh, and I'm just a moment from falling off and, and losing it all. But I'm the same moment from stepping back to safety. You wake up every morning of your life uh, not knowing if this is going to be the day I succeed or if this is going to be the day I fail. And I'm telling you, that battle that you got to fight uh, ain't your kids, uh, it ain't your husband, it ain't your job, it's in your mind. I tell people all the time, the only human being I can control is me.
two things got to be addressed. I understand I'm wading off into, because somebody's automatically going to think, I knew it. He told me I could do it. Shazam, I'm gone. Two things got to be addressed in identifying what needs to be girded up in my mind, the hindrances that need to be gone out of my mind. People, places, and things that lead me to such behavior must be either removed or modified where they no longer have that effect on me. Now this is not a reason or permission to just up go home and quit your job, get a divorce, kick your kids out. Okay, that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we've got to realize what is it Oh, man, I can meddle right now. And then the second thing, and I want everybody under the sound of my voice to hear me right now. I want everybody. We have a serious problem here sometimes. Some of us that came over on the ark, not the Mayflower, the ark. Sometimes we turn an off switch because we feel like certain things don't apply to us. I've heard people even say it in your conversation. I've heard that all my life. I know everything there is to know about that. You better be careful. The book says... If a man think he standeth, take heed, what? Lest he fall. The second area, the practical thing, people, places, and things. That's all the stuff out there. That's all the things in my life that lead me to such behavior, that lead me to my mind being all messed up. I was angry last night. I was angry. The main person I was angry with was myself. Because, Sister Maria, there was things going on all around me. Just two or three specific things. And I laid in the bed and I tossed and I turned and I tossed and I turned. And I gave a solid hour to that junk. Yeah, am I the only one? Huh? Huh? I got to find out what that is. Because you know, God's got big, great, great, great big plans for me. Somebody's got to get that attitude about them. Somebody's got to get that realization that this stuff that Brother GL's preaching, uh, I need it in my life uh, because God's going to do great things in my life and I'm going to see these miracles come to pass and I'm going to see the vision come to fruition. But I've got to apply this stuff. The second thing is... The second thing that's got to be addressed in identifying the, the hindrances and obstructions. I want you to listen to me now. Please listen to me. Sometimes. Sometimes. I'm the problem. Now we like. Somebody else to be the problem. But sometimes I'm the problem. When we're drawn to things that cause us anxiety, that cause us drama, that cause us to, to, to stand at our kitchen counter and find out we've been staring out the window for 45 minutes just tapping on the thing, thinking about all of this junk going on in our lives. When we're drawn to things, when things, th think about it. Oh man, I'm going to meddle right now so bad. I had a friend, I had a friend, and I'm talking about our minds. I don't want you to lose sight of that, I'm talking about our minds. But I had a friend in Louisiana that worked on the ambulance. Great big old husky fella, he could cook some crawfish. Lord have mercy. He, it wasn't Tim, it was somebody else. But he worked on the ambulance. And he got a call right not far from the boys' ranch where this old boy was beating the soup out of his wife. Beating the daylights out of her to the point that she took a butcher knife and stabbed him right there in the chest. Now she's all beat up. He beat the daylights out of her to the point that she stabbed him to get off. And do you know that they had to forcibly 
grab her and pull her off of him, squalling and bawling and hugging on him to even put him on the ambulance. Now we, th oh my God, I know I'm causing trouble right now. But she was squalling, my baby, my honey, I love him, oh, he's going to die. She tried to kill him. Now we think, how goofy can you be? But that's, it's a common thing. You read about it, anything, you know, if, if you stop looking at the choir and stop watching the Real Housewives and, and read anything in the news, you see it all the time. It's a, it's, a, it's a mentality they get. It's a victim mentality. It's an I deserved it. Okay? And we'll, we'll think, that's so stupid. But yet in our, in our minds, we allow ourselves to be abused by being taken to places in our minds. We allow people, we allow thoughts, we, we allow worries, and we allow somebody else's problems or somebody else's issues, and they don't want to change, but we keep inviting them into our life over and over and over and over and over. And I'm really causing trouble right now. But I'm right where somebody lives. Sometimes it's me. We have got to pray for courage. To conquer the desire to always be in the middle of something. We've got to have courage to conquer that desire. For instance, when you find yourself criticizing everything and everybody that comes down the road. Everybody gets a new car, everybody gets a new truck, everybody gets a new wife, everybody gets a new husband, everybody gets a new house, everybody gets a new couch, everybody gets a new dog. For goodness sake, they didn't need that dog. They won't take care of their last one. When you find yourself that way, Brother David, when you find your, and that's just an example, but when you find yourself, sometimes you're the problem. And sometimes what's messing up my mind is me. I got to have courage. And I want to let you know something. This is a practical thing. If you want to get the victory over yourself, being, ha, ha, come on now. How many people, you, you're constantly involving yourself in things and, and allowing people to invade your life, your privacy, and ultimately your mind. And they're laying up somewhere with somebody stoned out of their mind or drunk or bed hopping from one place to the next. And you're walking the floor every night worried about them. Boy, this ain't even in my notes. They ain't the problem. They're not the problem. You're the problem. Because nobody can do that to you unless you allow it to happen. And here's how we get the victory over ourselves. You want to know? Can anybody tell me? How do we get the victory over ourselves? You want to know? Say it loud. Pray and fast. Fasting is me crucifying me. This may just like be for only two people tonight and for the other 56 or whatever. I'm sorry. But you got to pray and fast. And one of the reasons why you're in incapable of praying and fasting is you're so drawn to their mess you can't get out of it. I'm talking about holiness of the mind. I have got to protect myself. I have got to protect myself. And sometimes I'm the problem. Sometimes the Lord has tried to make ways for me to get out of stuff. And, and I'm laying on top of my problem and crying and squalling and begging. And Lord Jesus, let me teach something else real soon. Because I'm preaching to people that, and she won't mind me saying this, but, you know, well, I had a few she's. So I'll just say it that way. 
But after the service Sunday night, I, I had several people the, who their hearts were pricked and, and their, 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 they, they felt a burden and they felt a desire and some of them were weeping uncontrollably and some of them came up with great ideas and stuff and, and wh- where we've got to go. Now I want you to hear me right now. Where we 